Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, it's unusual <laughs> format, but um, I'm thankful that we can still have the opportunity to share some ideas. So I'll go ahead and I often forget to start sharing the screen, so <laughs> hopefully get that going. All right, is that showing okay? All right, great. Uh, so the work I'm wanting to share with you today has been uh, work that I've been doing over the last couple years, I guess four or five years now, um, but focused on the Midwestern part of the US in this LUS and looking at the geochemical and hydrological fluxes. Okay, and this has been um, highly collaborative work. This is kind of a partial list, but the University of Nebraska at Omaha, I've been working with um, Dr. Andrew Miller, he's a chemist, uh, as well as others in the geography geology department. And then many students have helped collect these samples and monitor these sites, even some um, high school teachers. And then also have been working at the University of Iowa with uh, Art Bettis, who recently retired, and then um, Greg Mount at Indiana University of Pennsylvania has, has started helping collect some of this data. So the kind of framework for how I have been thinking about this landscape is thinking about what it used to look like before um, a lot of uh, our modern agriculture arrived. This was a largely prairie dominated landscape. And of course we have transformed this landscape. Almost all of it has been converted to um, intensively um, cropped systems. So kind of the overarching thing that I, we're thinking about is how does this human land use impact the critical zone or this zone near the surface. And if you're not familiar with the critical zone, this terminology, this is referring to this surface uh, where we extend from the top of the vegetation down to the groundwater. And it's, it's in simply it's where rock meets life, but this is that zone that's supporting most terrestrial life. So we have the um, organisms at the surface and um, the organisms in the subsurface, but it's this atmosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere, and biosphere kind of intersecting. And so this cartoon here just shows kind of what a, a classic slice of the critical zone might look like if we could extract a cross section. Um, we see a vegetated, uh, perhaps a forest or kind of meadow system overlying a um, groundwater and then, and then a solid rock system. Um, having events. So this is what it might look like in real life. This is an example from um, a field site in Wales that I've worked at in shale, where you've got the conifer vegetation um, up top that's rooted in this very fairly shallow soil zone, but uh, there's bedrock lying underneath that and that bedrock has some groundwater. So soil I think of as this central interface within this critical zone. It's supporting the the vegetation above and the terrestrial life. It's also an interface for gas and water exchange into that subsurface. And it can be very thin or very thick depending on where you are in the world. Uh, but this rock is what's breaking down in this case to form this soil. So this entire zone is a connected thing. Uh, we, we tend to focus on one part of this zone in our training, um, but uh, this idea of, of studying the critical zone would be thinking a little bit more holistically about uh, the interactions from above ground to below ground. So this would be in a natural system, but in the Midwestern United States, we have greatly modified this system. So instead of this cartoon on the left, where we have a slice of, of fairly natural system that's devoid of humans, and there's no, no humans or, or built infrastructure or modifications in that cartoon. Whereas on the right, this is a bit more representative of the types of systems in the Midwest, where we have modified the surface uh, through extensive tillage and tile drains. Uh, we have um, changed parts of the landscape that used to be um, more transient, such as floodplains. So we have drastically modified this system. And so thinking about this critical zone, what has this done to how this critical zone is structured and how it functions? So this is a bit more representative of the critical zone that we're familiar with in this part of the country. Um, I don't have a good slice into it, but we have a thickness, a fairly thick critical zone actually underlying the surface, but it's a very subdued landscape um, topographically, but heavily modified. And this is uh, an example from Eastern Iowa where there are uh, modifications at the surface. 
So the geology sets the stage for this landscape. Uh, we have a, in the Midwest, a landscape that was uh, glaciated about 10,000 years ago, completely covered in ice, and that ice reshaped the surface of that landscape. And when that ice started retreating at the end of the last glacial, it left behind this uh, fairly flat landscape, but a very um, diverse landscape of geologic materials in that there's glacial till that's left behind, there's outwash, and then a lot of luss or silt sized grains that are covering all of this landscape. So those sediments are, are setting the stage. And then on top of that, the, the life comes in and interacts with those materials. So instead of that hard rock that we have in kind of that classic example of a critical zone, we have these transported materials. And on top of those transported materials, uh, life begins to come back with uh, forest and wetland type vegetation and a lot of grassland areas. And at this point, we have kind of conceptualized this site as being a, a transforming landscape. So we're adding in carbon, we're adding in nutrients to this landscape. There's a lot of water. So it's dominated by a system where we're transforming those nutrients, those elements, and storing a lot of them in the landscape. Whereas recently, when we've intensified agriculture within the last couple hundred years, we have dramatically reshaped that landscape and also how those nutrients and those fluxes are moving through that landscape. So we can conceptually think of this as now a transporter dominated landscape. So that carbon, those nutrients, those sediments, rather than being stored in the landscape, they are often now transported um, across this landscape or into different parts of this landscape. So this uh, framework here, thinking of this, this intensively modified critical zone, intensively managed critical zone, we have a lot of factors that are all interconnected. So we have pools of carbon, we have soil, we have water, we have nutrient fluxes, and then all of the vegetation, uh, the ecology part of this, these are all interconnected, these inter they interface within this zone, but are moving at different scales or transforming at different scales. So that's one of the things we've been thinking about is under natural systems, there would be a certain rate of transformations, but under intensive agriculture, the goal has been to overcome those rate limitations of those biogeochemical reactions in order to maximize crop production. So these in incredibly productive landscapes, that has been our goal, is to use them in a way um, that, that under natural circumstances would be much slower transformations. We need those transformations to happen more rapidly to get the high productivity. So this has been a great benefit for agriculture and we've been able to greatly increase our capacity to grow crops. Some of the downsides to this are well-known nutrient fluxes to the wa to water bodies. So instead of, of storing these nutrients on the landscape or in the vegetation they're getting into the water, there has been significant soil erosion, so loss of those sediments. And then ultimately this leads to questions of sustainability. So are we able, going to be able to sustain this high intensive land management um, into the future? Or is there some kind of limit to that high productivity that we're going to encounter because of changing this function in the critical zone? So within um, this region, this work has been part of a larger critical zone observatory program funded by the National Science Foundation. And this is a series, this program funded a series of sites across the US with the idea to study this entire critical zone from that vegetation to the groundwater down below and think of, of crossing those disciplines and looking across those interfaces. So the black stars on here are sites that were funded as part of that program, which just ended uh, this year. I think actually at the end of the month it officially ends. Um, the next phase of the critical zone observatories uh, are critical zone networks. And we uh, just received funding to continue this work as a network of sites that will expand beyond just these critical zone observatories or CZOs. And um, that's part of this new critical interfaces network. So this idea that there are critical interfaces within the landscape and how we manage the systems um, that affect the critical zone structure and function. So I'm going to focus on the sites, uh, these three, um, or kind of this, what, what was previously called the Intensively Managed Landscapes Critical Zone Observatory, and then this yellow star, which is a site in Nebraska, 
But the key here is that all of these sites in all of this region was glaciated. So this black line illustrates the extent of glaciation in the region. Um, and so all these are, are underlain by glacial parent materials. And then almost all of these sites have extensive lust deposits. So this is a, a map of lust thicknesses in the region. So in, across Iowa, there's significant accumulations of lust as well as in um, eastern Nebraska. So we have a very extensive parent material to think about uh, soils forming in and these critical zone processes occurring in um, within this region. And of course, this is our significant agricultural uh, productivity region. So I'll focus in on today on data from two of these sites, one in eastern Iowa and one in eastern Nebraska. The Iowa site was part of this intensively managed landscapes critical zone observatory. This site in Nebraska is now part of this bigger network of critical interface um, observatories. And the two sites are about 400 kilometers apart, uh, pretty about four hour drive on, on Interstate 80, and are fairly similar climatically. They're about 10 degrees mean annual temperature, um, and there is wetter conditions for mean annual precipitation in Iowa than in Nebraska, so we have a bit of a, a moisture gradient across these two sites. The watersheds that we're work we've been working in vary are different sizes, but have fairly similar uh, characteristics in that there's agriculture and there's also a little bit of restored prairie. So in Nebraska, this is a fairly small watershed, about half a square kilometer, very thick luss, about 10 meters of luss that's overlying this glacial till. And half of the watershed is still in agriculture. It's now no-till, corn, soybean rotation, but it is uh, continuously cropped. And then the lower half of the watershed, or the southern half, has been restored to prairie about 50 years ago now. So we have a contrasting land use within this small watershed. And there are, is a stream draining this watershed, which has one fork that drains largely agricultural land and one fork that drains largely prairie land. So we're using this site to contrast these land uses and see what happens when you take something that was previously in intensive agriculture and restore it back to prairie. What, how does that change the function of the soils and the critical zone here compared to, um, to approximate or, or try to understand what this land used to look like? And the same in Iowa. This watershed is much larger, about 270 square kilometers. The less is a little bit thinner here and, and varies a little bit throughout the watershed, um, but it's dominantly agriculture. So 98% of this watershed is in agriculture, uh, but there is a little bit of restored prairie that we're using as a comparison. And that, that's only been about 20 years of restoration. So these sites have been instrumented with um, a range of, of sensors to monitor the conditions. And I'll talk about those here in a second. Uh, we also have hoped to measure native prairie, um, but that is quite hard to find in this region. In Nebraska, there is a little patch of remnant prairie uh, that is um, about five kilometers from our study site, this Glacier Creek, where we have agriculture and restored prairie. And then in Iowa, the closest thing we could find was a um, pioneer cemetery that we could sample and, and approximate what conditions look like um, or what the soils look like before uh, they were transformed to agriculture. So the overarching question here uh, that we're trying to study through looking at these sites with different land uses is how does that change in management at the soil surface? So what we're doing in the very upper um, less than a meter of the soil, how does that change not only what's happening at the surface there but also uh, the water and the, the fluxes of sediments through the entire system. So I'll use this kind of simple schematic to kind of illustrate um, or this conceptual model of how we're thinking about the system where we have potentially um, a system dominated by agriculture or a system dominated by uh, restored prairie. So what happens when you take that land from intensive agriculture and put it back in prairie? How does that transformation differ? I mentioned that we're using a lot of different sensors to collect this data. Uh, we have at both Nebraska and Iowa, we have basic meteorological sensors above ground, as well as soil sensors in the ground that are measuring moisture, temperature, and electrical conductivity at four depths down to a meter. 
Uh, we have uh, groundwater wells in Iowa and just recently installed in Nebraska as well to try and, and get that deeper water. We sample every two weeks to one month, um, depending in COVID year, it's been more like a month, every month, the different pools of water in the system. So we collect the precipitation just from uh, some little funnels. We collect the soil pore water through some suction lysimeters, at, again at four depths down to a meter. And then we collect stream grab samples on both that, um, the streams draining restored prairie and agriculture. We have some shallow groundwater wells and now some deeper groundwater wells we can sample. And then in the stream, we have continuous sensors uh, that are measuring discharge and things like dissolved oxygen, temperature, pH, and redox potential every 15 minutes. So we're getting high resolution data of the outputs from this watershed in Nebraska in particular. We also have collected soil cores. I was talking um, before the seminar started about, about how much, how nice it is to have Giddings probes or to, to collect cores. I only just last week had the first opportunity to use one of those. Typically we have been collecting these by hand with just a hand auger, but we can get down 10 meters. And then we've done some soil pits down to two meters to actually look at the soils, not just at that surface, but what's happening deeper into this very thick critical zone that we have in this LUS and till parent material. So conceptually, we have started monitoring most of the system at the ridge tops in, to try and minimize the complexity of the system. Here we can think about inputs as being largely one dimensional. We have precipitation coming in and then under agriculture, we have fertilizer addition. But other than that, we wouldn't expect addition of materials from upslope to be contributing. So we started at these sites, um, and hope to eventually um, study more of the hill slopes but we have our sensors installed uh, for our weather stations, our precipitation collectors, our pore water samplers, and then our soil cores and pits at the ridge top. And then in that stream, we're measuring what's coming out of the system. So trying to capture what's coming in and then what's out. And then in the future, hopefully unpacking a bit of the black box of what's in the middle. We can observe changes in the soils pretty dramatically uh, just by observing. Um, we, I don't have a pit yet from the Nebraska native prairie, but this is what the Pioneer Cemetery in eastern Iowa looks like. Very, very uh, beautiful mollusol here um, in that soil that has not been converted to agriculture. This is what we would have expected a lot of the Midwest to look like, these mollusols, organic rich grassland soils. Um, once we convert those soils to agriculture, it's well documented, you tend to lose a lot of that carbon, you change the rooting structure, you change the aggregates of the soils. But once we restore that soil, um, after just 50 years, in this case and in Nebraska, we see a pretty dramatic morphologic difference in these soils where we have an increase in organic matter in the upper part of the soil, and then these root networks that extend all the way down two meters into the, to the subsurface. So in just a, uh, several decades, we're transitioning back towards what would have been more like the native conditions. And so we have a, a bit of a timestamp on that chronology, knowing the land use history. So I'll start first by um, introducing some the data from the Nebraska site we have on soil moisture. This is the volumetric water content for the Nebraska agricultural site on the bottom and the prairie site on the top at our four different depths into the subsurface. And this is just for one year for 2017. The black lines show the precipitation events and then these colored bars are showing the soil moisture response. And what's notable is that the prairie seems to respond very rapidly to incoming precipitation, that, that water infiltrates fairly deeply and rapidly, uh, but then it is fairly dry very quickly in the, in the upper parts of the soil, whereas the agricultural soil tends to stay pretty wet throughout most of the year and doesn't seem to respond as deeply or rapidly to those incoming precipitation events. So if we average, take the average water content over this year for these different sites, we have significantly wetter soils under the agricultural conditions than we do under the prairie conditions. So we're, we think this is suggesting that there's slower drainage in those prairies or in those agricultural soils. So we're, we're getting less um, rapid infiltration. <clears throat> 
And similarly, when we look at the electrical conductivity in those soils, again, same plot with the electrical conductivity this time for that one year of data. Overall, there's higher electrical conductivity at all depths in the agricultural site compared to the prairie site, uh, regardless of precipitation event. And on average, we have significantly higher electrical conductivity in that agriculture. So there's more solutes or more weathered products in those agricultural soils than the prairie soils, which are more dilute. We can then measure the concentrations of, of elements in that soil pour water. And we saw things like higher nitrate concentrations under agriculture that we might expect. But when we look at the cations, we actually see significantly higher concentrations of magnesium and calcium under the agricultural soils compared to the prairie soils. So that was um, a finding we didn't expect, given that these are, are not limed systems. They are, um, those elements are not being added through precipitation or fertilizers, um, but yet there's more higher concentrations in those pore waters. And we see the same thing at the sites over in Iowa, where the soils under agriculture have higher concentrations in the soil pore water of calcium and magnesium than the prairie. Similarly, the total fluxes of the magnesium and calcium are higher in the agricultural sites. So if we look at the total amount of those elements that are being flushed through those soils, uh, again, the calcium and magnesium seems to be elevated um, in the agricultural soils. We can then in Nebraska look at those two streams draining the agriculture or the prairie and look at the concentration of these same elements in those streams. And we actually find the opposite in the stream concentrations where the prairie draining stream actually has higher magnesium and calcium concentrations than the agricultural draining stream. And remember that was inverse of what we saw in the soil pore water. So we had initially thought if the pore water is connected to those streams, if that water is then draining to the streams, then the relative concentrations should be similar. So there's a little bit of a, um, a source we may be missing here. And when we look at the total flux of elements leaving the agricultural side, they do in fact drain more magnesium and calcium from that system. So we think this is indicating that those concentrations that we measure, when we account for the actual total volume of water, they're, they're being diluted by another source of water, which we think may be overland flow. So there's very shallow water that's, that's draining these high concentration waters, but then there's also this overland flow that might be contributing more dilute precipitation waters. So end of um, kind of net result here though is that we are seeing chemical differences in the stream based on the land use that it's draining. So this builds our conceptual model where we think we might be seeing under agriculture this fairly slow infiltration and shallow infiltration of water that then leads to fairly shallow flow paths to the, the stream where we're picking up that in, enhanced calcium and magnesium flux. Whereas under the prairie system, we are getting more rapid and deep infiltration. And we think that that water may be taking longer flow paths to get to the stream rather than, than taking a short, shallow path. We think that the mechanism driving this change in hydrology is probably due to the change in soil structure that's associated with that land use. So under agriculture, uh, there used to be tillage at the site, even in Nebraska, um, there no longer is, um, but even with that, that minimal or no-till system, we do not build uh, much aggregate structure. We don't have the rooting networks that are creating pore space, whereas when we restore that prairie, we get the rooting um, enhanced and that's the restore, restoration of that soil structure. And a little bit of data we have now to uh, that confirms what we're seeing morphologically. We have wet, wet aggregate stability for uh, the upper two meters of these soils, where in Nebraska, the native prairie and the restored prairie, they have a very high percentage of uh, wet aggregate stability compared to the agricultural site. And that aggregate stability is it rapidly decreases uh, below the upper 10 centimeters. So we, we have almost no soil structure that's water stable whereas that restored prairie is actually approximating what we find in a prairie that has never been uh, used for agriculture. So this change in, in land use causes this change in structure and that's now changing how the water's flowing through. We're also seeing some evidence 
through some electrical resistance tomography uh, surveys. These are um, electrical resistivity. This is work with uh, Dr. Greg Mount, where we're using um, electrodes or, or metal poles, little uh, poles that go in the ground across these transects. You can see these transects in green from agriculture over to prairie, and then some slope parallel transects that we've done. We stick these the metal rods in the ground, apply some electrical current, and the resistance of the materials to, that, to delivering that electrical current gives you some information about the subsurface, both the materials that are down there and also the saturation state of those materials. And to give you an idea of what this data looks like from the agriculture to the ridge site, so we have the ridge top of the agriculture down to the stream and then up to the prairie. The differences in color are, are color mapped to show differences in resistivity. So uh, bluer means lower resistivity, uh, higher is, is, is meaning more resistive to conducting that electricity. So anything that is um, bluer means that it's, it's likely wetter. It's able to conduct that electricity a bit better. And these arrows here are pointing to anthropogenic terraces. So this entire landscape, while it was still in agriculture, was terraced and those have left an imprint on the surface of the landscape uh, that continues despite the fact that part of this is, is now in prairie. And looking closer at some of this data from the agriculture side, we think we see lower resistivity kind of at the surface there that suggests that water is staying a bit shallower, whereas under the prairie side, we get these brighter spots of color showing potentially that there's better drainage or that water is infiltrating out of the surface of those soils um, down more deeply. Um, apologize there. And then we also see um, at these terraces, these, this what appears to be some pooling of water behind these terraces under uh, the shallow uh, flow conditions. So even though we're in prairie or in agriculture, the imprint of those terraces is still um, evident in the hydrology of the system, regardless of land use. So this is kind of some preliminary data, but we've, we've, it's helping us kind of image the subsurface and see what's down deeper in addition to just these two, these couple cores that we have um, to, to look at. And, and it's pointing to this change in hydrology that seems to be associated with these different land uses in this less overtill system. So with this less parent material sitting on top of the till, we think that's where the groundwater is largely sitting. So all the water that moves to that LUS is interacting with that LUS soil. And when we are draining water deeper, that precipitation makes it deeper into the subsurface. We think that that allows that water to interact with deeper minerals in the subsurface. Whereas on that agricultural side where the water is just infiltrating fairly slowly and kind of getting stuck under that soil, where that water is then interacting with more shallow minerals um, rather than those deeper minerals. And we see evidence for this, we think, when we look at the geochemical profiles of these soils. So this is the entire 10 meters of core that we have under the Nebraska prairie and the agricultural site. And the calcium and magnesium data here is plotted as a tau value. And if you're not familiar with this, it's just a way to normalize the concentrations to the initial parent material. So you're looking at what the material started with, uh, what kind of elemental concentrations, and then how much has it deviated or, or lost that material that's weathered out compared to what you started with. So a tau value of zero would mean no change from what you started with in your parent material. Anything negative means you've, you've leached out that element or washed it out. And we see very different profiles of calcium and magnesium under the prairie and the agriculture. Under the prairie, it's we've lost about half of our calcium and magnesium um, totals. And that profile is very gradual before it returns to initial concentrations. Whereas under agriculture, we've lost um, calcium and magnesium from the upper parts of the soils, but about a meter and a half, we are accumulating calcium and magnesium. And we think this might be the precipitation of calcite and perhaps even dolomite minerals in the subsurface under the system where you're just not draining um, water very deeply. Whereas once you restore that prairie, allowing that water to go deeper, we get deeper dissolution of that calcium and, uh, or the calcite and the dolomite. We see similar profiles over in the Iowa soils as well. So here's the Nebraska profiles we just looked at. 
the Iowa prairie is, is very shallow, less soil, so it's why its profile is very um, short here, but it shows a similar gradual decrease in the subsurface, an increase at the surface that we're not sure about, but a decrease in the subsurface, whereas under agriculture, there's a, a leaching or washing of that material out of the top, but a very sharp reaction front where we're accumulating that calcium and magnesium. But that reaction front is deeper because we think the enhanced precipitation at that site would be washing uh, those dissolved uh, elements a little bit deeper into the profile. But we seem to be accumulating some of this um, cal calcite in under agriculture. And mineralogically, we see that as well. This is some mineralogy data for those uh, the upper eight meters here of those cores from Nebraska. Under the restored prairie, we have almost uh, no calcite or dolomite in the upper surface until we get down about three meters, whereas under agriculture, we see an accumulation of that calcite and dolomite much closer to the surface, which corresponds to those geochemical profiles. So even though we're managing just at the upper surface and we know that we would expect changes where we're actively kind of touching that soil in these systems, um, we're, we think we're seeing effects you know, many, several meters down into the subsurface. The other thing that's striking to me about this propagation of, of the influence of that land change is, is it's fairly rapid. So we're talking 20 to 50 years since the time agriculture ceased and prairie was restored. So these effects that we're seeing at the surface um, and all the way down to the streams are potentially uh, propagating over, over several decades, which is not what I expected to find um, given, um, especially thinking about soil processes tending to be soil formation is slow, geologic processes are slow. Um, this seems to be responding uh, fairly rapidly. We also see um, some interesting differences with carbon and we're just starting to probe a bit more into the, this carbon story but looking at the soil profile, organic carbon and inorganic carbon contents. So this again is the 10 meter depth cores for Nebraska here. We have a native, the restored and the agricultural prairie. Under the native prairie, we have very high organic carbon content that you would expect over um, many, many millennia of accumulating carbon. Whereas the restored prairie is approaching that native prairie, but not there yet. And agriculture with its intensive uh, tillage and land use has the lowest organic carbon content. But when we go to depth, we start seeing some interesting trends where we actually have an accumulation of organic carbon uh, about a meter and a half down. And that corresponds where we're getting an accumulation of inorganic carbon as well. So we're curious and starting to work uh, with uh, Dr. Michael Kaiser at uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln to see about is there some co-precipitation of that organic material with these uh, inorganic carbonates that might be actually kind of storing that carbon in the subsurface under the agricultural system. So at the very surface we see what, what we would expect given this darker color, but there is more of a carbon story as we go deeper into the soil and actually a lot of carbon that's stored under there that may not be uh, accounted for. Oops. And if we uh, calculate the cumulative soil and organic carbon that's stored in these different profiles, this is the, again, this 10 meter depth. This is the cumulative organic carbon. So if we calculate just the upper meter, which would be um, most studies tend to go only the upper, maybe 30 to 50 centimeters, but counting for the upper meter, we would expect, as we would expect, the native prairie has stored more carbon there. Um, compared to the restored prairie and the agriculture. But then as we go deeper, because of that um, organic carbon that seems to be uh, at the same depth as that organic, inorganic carbon, um, we're actually potentially storing cumulatively more organic carbon under that agricultural system. So what I'm intrigued to think about is, is that change in hydrology, is that somehow uh, allowing um, deeper carbon to be oxidized or, or moved out of the system or relocated within the system um, compared to that agricultural system, which is just not allowing the water to drain. And we've started trying to probe what the role of biota might be in driving some of these changes that we see in the subsurface. This is some data from the Cornell Soil Health Lab uh, looking at can we use some of these soil health indicators to help us um, understand what might be abiotically versus biotically driven. This is active carbon here again for that uh, upper six meters of these soil profiles. This active carbon is just the readily oxidizable carbon that we would find in these soils. Again at the surface as 
we would expect the native prairie has more active carbon compared to the native stored and the agriculture and this drops off rapidly in the um, agricultural system. That restored prairie is, is, a pro is getting much closer to that native one um, than, uh, than the agriculture in just that short time. But when we look at respiration, uh, this, in the subsurface, there seems to be um, an interesting bulge here under the agricultural site where there's higher respiration down at that kind of meter, meter and a half, uh, where we were seeing that accumulation of organic carbon. So don't know yet what, how much of that um, might be driven by biota that are, are somehow processing that carbon or playing a role in transforming that carbon at depth, uh, but some, but there's some interesting things happening um, beneath that surface. And so if we had just stopped at the surface um, and hadn't looked deeper, we might um, not be able to tease apart what's happening deeper into this critical zone. So next steps for working in this system, um, we will, we now have funding to continue um, thinking about these um, interfaces throughout the critical zone. And the first thing we'll be working on is looking at some groundwater pools. So we've measured kind of the inputs, the shallow soil, and then the stream. Well, what about what's happening in between to um, that water as it moves through these critical zones? So we just in May were able to install deeper wells, uh, one at the ridge top and then two um, and kind of the shallower uh, Vado zone and then into that deeper groundwater on the mid slopes. And then we have some shallow wells now closer to the stream both on the agricultural side and the prairie side in this Nebraska site that we can compare now with the Iowa um, groundwater wells that we have in the two, to two land uses. So the idea here is that we could start to track that water and see what is happening to it. Um, is it in fact different uh, chemical flow paths that are driving what we're seeing as outputs from this stream? We also have been collecting stable isotope data on these different pools of water to hopefully help us uh, track that water as it moves through the system and understand how these land uses might be influencing uh, that water flux. We've just started to try and quantify some of the dust inputs. Uh, I found this much more difficult to trap this dust than I expected, considering on your cars and your house that it's quite easily obtained. Uh, but we're using uh, very simple bunt pans with marbles inside to try and uh, trap any dust that might be in the air to see what might that be contributing in this region to the soil formation. And then finally, I mentioned those high frequency data sets that we have in the stream that's draining uh, this watershed in Nebraska. Uh, we've just started unpacking some of this data. There's a lot of it, uh, but it's kind of exciting to see what we can um, what we can observe when we have this high frequency data. This is an example of the discharge over a year at the stream. You see the spikes in precipitation that that increase the discharge from the stream. But when we zoom in, we can actually see diurnal fluxes in that discharge. So over several days, the water level of the stream will decrease during the day and then overnight the water level rises and then decreases and we see the same diurnal pattern with a lot of other parameters such as the um, FDOM which is approximating or is measuring the organic matter, the um, pH, the um, some of the other chemical parameters. So we think that there is um, a biological signature here with the grass vegetation as they take up the water during the day, it's changing the level of the stream water and also altering some of those um, physical and chemical parameters of the stream. So a lot of things we wouldn't be able to detect if we just sampled every two weeks, uh, but we can now get um, better resolution data. We just got funding to put in a nitrate sensor here as well, so we'll get a better picture of the nitrate fluxes um, out of this watershed as well. And then going forward with this new project, the other thing we're hoping to do is to more intensely monitor what's happening in this um, root zone under the, these intensively managed systems as well as below that root zone. So we're calling this the Management Induced Reactive Zone or MERS for short, just to give it a name. But when we change things, change the system by putting in tile drains, by intensively managing the surface. How is that influencing kind of this rhizosphere, but also uh, what's happening um, to the um, 
part of the soil that's not influenced by these roots. So we're in the process of trying to design these systems and figure out how to co-measure these parameters, not only the solute fluxes, but we also want to get the gases, the gaseous fluxes of CO2 and O2 to try and tease out that abiotic biotic um, influence there. And we hope to install these systems um, in Illinois, Iowa, and Nebraska under, under crop systems, as well as under restored prairie to look at that influence. What is, what is happening as that zone is, is modified, as those roots are growing? How can we use that data to help model and predict um, how this is changing the fluxes of those nutrients and, and carbon out of the system? So just to summarize kind of our initial kind of conceptual idea of how we're thinking about the, these intensively managed landscapes, we think that this um, agricultural land use, we know that it um, is, is greatly modifying the surface and because it disrupts that poor connectivity in the surface, that changes that soil hydrology. And it's not just affecting the surface of the soils, but it's, it's influencing much deeper into the soils and even to the streams that are draining these watersheds. So this soil and poor water, soil poor water and stream chemistry that is um, kind of feeling the effects of this land use. And it's just, it's hap we're, we think we're picking up this signal in less than 50 years. So that land use can have broader or uh, bigger effects within the critical zone than just what we typically measure at the soil surface. So we'll continue to be um, working on this, thinking about these implications of transitioning from a transformer landscape where we're storing a lot of these nutrients and a lot of this carbon on the landscape. How does that um, change as we um, modify that surface, the structure, the function, and then ultimately the sustainability. Can we, can we make predictions on how to manage these landscapes because we do need to, to have this intensive management? How can we um, target those critical interfaces and those zones where we, we are seeing these kind of hot spots of activity? What can we do to, to manage that so that we can maintain that high productivity? So I'd like to thank all of you for um, joining this seminar and for the invitation to, to share this work with you. Uh, I do wish I could have been um, in person to meet many of you, but uh, it's still exciting to share and also a lot of funding um, sources, especially from um, NSF and then uh, locally from um, Barbie Hayes at our local field site and the university. I'm happy to answer any questions if you uh, have any. Yeah, so hey, Ashley, this is, uh, this is uh, Mike Castellano. Good to see Hi, you. Hi, Mike. Oh, my gosh. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really disappointing you couldn't come in person. I know. Uh, At least I'm not far away, so. <laughs> yeah, Sunday. no, it's, it's really great to hear what you're up to. Uh, the, yeah, very, like all, really interesting altogether. Um, so this change in hydrology really seems to underpin a lot of the things that you, you see between the ag and the, and the prairie systems. And one thing that came to my mind as you were showing us some of those data was that um, on the surface flow hypothesis that's diluting the cations potentially, I wonder how you filter those samples because I would expect in the ag system that if you weren't to take out some of the particulate stuff that might get trapped in this, you, um, you might find that um, it's, it's really high, the surface flow uh, runoff in some of those cations. Um, you're talking the, the particles, the actual solid flux? Yeah, uh -huh. like I, we, would, we would typically use like a 0.45 micrometer filter, which mm -hmm. would eliminate all that stuff. Um, right. Yeah, and I, I was I won't, like, if you did it both ways, with and without. You know. Yeah, um, and, and so you're talking about the streams. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a good point. We do filter with 0.45 um, so that we are missing that the particle flux out of there. We have data of the um, total solid flux from those stream sensors, and they, they are, there is higher solids flux out of that agriculture side compared to the prairie. But we haven't chemically measured those yet. That would be an interesting thing to do to filter out those particles and actually look at what, what geochemically they look like. So there's definitely more solid particles leaving that agricultural side um, as we would expect from most agricultural systems, but I don't know what it's made of, I guess. Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that might be a good way to confirm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Anyway, well, thanks again. I want to yeah. catch up with you about the carbon changes, though. I'm really intrigued by those. We have some very, very similar results, although we think about subsoil as being like 150 centimeters. I know. <laughs> I used to as well, <laughs> but um, I've gotten really good at augering deeper than that, so I um, kind of get excited about looking at that deeper part. So I would be very interested to share or to, yeah, to see what you're seeing and, and that's a little bit my question. Is this anomaly? Is this just happened to be the few sites that we've sampled or is there something more systematic due to that, um, that hydrology change? Yeah, yeah, I'll try and catch up with you uh, sometime after. Yeah, to talk Great. about that. Yeah, thanks yeah. again, Ashley. Good, yeah. good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Any other questions to Dr. Devere. Hi, Ashley. Hi. My name is Bob Horton. Hi. I'm in soil science here at Iowa State. Great. Uh, yeah, I followed what you said about the, uh, I believe, calcium and magnesium, you know, looking at different concentrations, but I didn't quite catch how you determined the fluxes of calcium and magnesium. So that was um, based on the um, volume of water that was that we extracted from those different lysimeters, um, assuming a, a given a fixed area over which those lysimeters are sampling the water. So we just use that uh, area and the, the volume of the water to look at um, how much, yeah, what would the total flux would be. So how much area would, would be one lysimeter, like we a cross-sectional area? We assumed um, 25 square centimeters based on the dimensions of the lysimeter that we used, the, the porous cup or the suction cup lysimeter that we used. That was kind of the, what the company said would be the estimated yeah. uh, kind of area so, it would be sampling from. So in, just in general, it's hard to get fluxes accurately. And there's a, you know, the spatial variability of the flow velocities through porous media is mm -hmm. huge. Yes. So it's hard to extrapolate uh, from small measurements to the bigger scale. That's just one idea. Yeah. A, a second topic I wanted to ask you is, like the last one you were showing some variability in your stream flow, mm -hmm. is that it? Diurnal yeah. variability. How, how deep is the stream, do you know? It's only about a meter deep. It's a very small stream. Okay. And uh, yeah, so it's it's a very it's a perennial or yeah it's a perennial stream, but it's it's very a fairly small first order stream, and we see the same diurnal patterns in the ground the shallow groundwater wells. We have the uh, data loggers in those wells, and they show the same kind of magnitude of fluctuation on a diurnal scale. Okay, yeah, cause you mentioned about the maybe a, a biotic effect. Uh, from maybe transpiration and on and off. I was just going to mention that uh, I've also seen some work more from irrigated agriculture. So it's probably shallower uh, ponded water, but uh, diurnal temperature variations showing different uh, fluxes of water uh, because the temperature is affecting the viscosity and it, which, yeah. it, which is part of the hydraulic connectivity. I've seen that. I don't know that that would be a factor for you, but I wanted just to mention it to you today. Yeah, that is a good, yeah, there's certainly a temperature variability. Um, yeah, I'll have to go back and look at that. Yeah, I think um, they've seen this in forested systems with this diurnal uh, transpiration signal, which is what we were thinking is, is likely the best explanation here. But yeah, I hadn't thought about viscosity change. All right, thank you. I enjoyed yeah, your talk well, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Ashley, this is Soterios of Contulis. I have a question about the soil moisture. Mm -hmm. Some very nice results with the moisture at different levels. And my understanding is that the main conclusion is the lower soil moisture is because of the higher infiltration and higher drainage. Right. And uh, my question to you is, what's any good reason to eliminate the factor of evapotranspiration? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we do have data on evapotranspiration uh, because of the weather stations that we have above. And it's what we measure is it's slightly higher evapotranspiration from the agricultural side compared to the prairie. Um, oh, but it's not, um, and it may be that I'm not analyzing statistically the best methods um, with that data, but not a significant difference, at least the way that I've analyzed the data. I suspect there's a more sophisticated way to statistically separate out. Um, but the evapotranspiration between the two sites is not uh, a huge difference, which I, I kind of thought it would be bigger, but it doesn't seem to be that that could explain entirely the differences um, in that we're seeing in the subsurface moisture. So there. I would expect the other way around, more of a transpiration with the prairies. Right, and I, yeah, we don't see that big of a difference. And so, um, if I remember correctly, it's actually, yeah, I was slightly higher from the agricultural side. I'd have to go double check that, but not enough of a difference to, uh, at least based on those weather stations and just the, I think it's, yeah, Penman Monteith kind of basic calculation, um, not enough of a difference to account for that much difference in soil moisture. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley, this is Marshall. Hi, Marshall. I'm having a Penn State reunion here. I know. So great. Out. I really enjoyed the talk. I, you know, the one thing I kept thinking about, you had some really cool findings. The one thing I kept thinking about is what role does erosion play in a lot of the, your findings, right? Because you had a lot of these reaction fronts were, were more shallow in the ag system. Is that just because there's been more erosion of that surface soil? And are you all planning on measuring erosion rates any, any ways or? Yeah, no, that's a good question. That was my initial um, thought was that maybe it's just eroded away, but it would need to have eroded um, over a meter of soil, almost two meters of soil, to account for those different um, depths to those reaction fronts. And, we, and so I, it's possible, it certainly is possible, but that in those 50 years since agriculture ceased on the one side, that that magnitude of erosion just didn't seem, um, especially in that terrace system where we're at a ridge top topographic position um, under minimum um, known till system, I, I just, it, seems less likely, uh, but it is a possibility. The other thing is we're measuring the solids fluxes out of the stream here, and um, they, are, are, they are higher on the agricultural side than the prairie, but they are not um, anywhere near what's measured in other agricultural systems. So there's a, a bit of a buffer strip. Um, there's the terracing, and then there's a buffer strip right next to the stream. So in, on the net, it seems that the sediments are, are being trapped on the, the hill slope, not entering the stream, uh, but there's not uh, evidence for a lot of erosion uh, as, as from a sediment flux standpoint or from a um, surface morphology kind of standpoint. So it is possible, um, but it seems like it would have to have had a lot of erosion and that we would be seeing that accumulate somewhere or leave the system. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? As we are getting close to the end of our time, leaving us four minutes. Hey, I'm back again. Hey. <laughs> I, uh, I can't help but say what I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> about the uh, carbon, mm -hmm. organic carbon accumulation under in the deep agricultural site. I mean, that's uh, so different than anything I've heard before. So different than anything I've heard before that uh, I'm predicting uh, if, it's, if it's right, a Nobel Prize for your group for finding that uh, agriculture is really, really good. You know, this kind of agriculture is really, really good for uh, carbon sequestration or an ignoble prize for your group right. for some kind of goof up there. Right. But I maybe maybe Dr. Castellano was talking about this point earlier, but really encourage you to, to really look at that, dig in on that and, and careful. 
carefully right. because it's so different than what I've heard before. Thank you. Right. And I, I would not expect it to, to maybe hold up when we look at the region as a whole because the surface is so different, but it is, um, it's what we're seeing in the data. And that's, there's, there's a reason and, and maybe there's a, uh, maybe it's geogenic. My initial thought was, you know, paleosol or something, you know, there's some other explanation that would explain it. Um, I'm not ready to make that claim or it's just a, an observation we've seen and um, I'd like to look into it further and, and yeah, would not expect that that's going to be the solution to our, our carbon storage challenge is to do more intensive agriculture. But um, I'm intrigued by that carbonate accumulation, if that is in fact happening, and then what the role of, of storing any organic carbon there might be. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Deer, we had a few comments in the chat. Um, Dr. Michael Thompson said, look for evidence of the paleosol. Mm -hmm. um, and then Dr. Castellano, it's what we're seeing across the Midwest, so. Yeah, and the paleosol, that was initially um, what I was hunting for or, or expecting to find would be that there are in these 10, at least the 10 meters that we've sampled, I think there's probably in Nebraska, probably about 15 meters of total lust that we have over the till. I thought there would be clear evidence of paleosols um, in the particle size distribution, in the, or the carbon distribution, uh, but I, I haven't found what I understand to be paleosols, but would appreciate, I'm not an, I, I not worked extensively in paleosols, but um, it's not been, I have not found much evidence to point to that's, that's what's different um, in, the, in the profiles, not yet. We are coming at that two o'clock time. If anyone has any last questions or comments. So thank you once again, Dr. Deer, for giving us that, that amazing presentation. Um, 